So hello everyone and happy Halloween. If this was happening in person, we would all have been dressing up at the store. So I decided I need at least a cute headband and um, cause that's what I would have been doing in the store. I have so many of them and I look forward to wearing them on multiple Zoom chats too. So we would love to hear what you're all dressing up as today. So please do share that in the chat as well. My name is Grace and I'm the events producer at University Bookstore in Seattle. Let us know where you're Zooming in from because that's the beauty of these Zoom events is that we can reach people who normally wouldn't be able to get to our store. With me behind the scenes is Mieko, one of our event coordinators. We would both like to thank you all for spending this spooky afternoon with us and in the company of two phenomenal authors. We're thrilled to celebrate the launch of Martha Brokenbro's latest Into the Blood Red Woods. Martha will be in conversation with Alana Kerr Arnold, author of Damsel. Wave to everybody. <laughs> um, and uh, I think that it's also this time I should note that there are two rare authors who are gonna be joining us today. Something happened when Alana came to visit. I don't know, Martha, do you have something to share? <laughs> I might have bitten her. It was a dark and stormy night. <laughs> yes, it seems so. So we have two rare <laughs> authors with us. So we have hosted so many of Martha's spectacular launch parties at University Bookstore in person. And so I told them I was just so thrilled because here we have this absolutely fun, like costumed appearance, a really, really spooky mantle, which we're going to get to peek at periodically. You can see a little bit of it here now. And while I'm sad that we can't gather together today in that same way now, I'm also really grateful that we have this platform to celebrate with our book community and just unite readers from like all across the country and sometimes all across the world. So that's just been really just heartwarming to me during this time and really kept me going. And I know so many of you through this pandemic. So let's get on with it. Martha Broken really needs no introduction, but I'm going to introduce her anyway, because we have to do that. <laughs> so we're all huge fans of her writing, of course, but also her incredible kindness and warmth. Um, I think that I started working um, in events and doing her, first, her book launches and just working with her with some of my very first events at the bookstore. She just makes everyone feel comfortable and just just like we all matter. So thank you, Martha, for that. And her support of fellow writers, those in the bookselling community and her readers is also well known. And I think I can speak for everybody here <laughs> to say that we're all incredibly lucky to know you, Martha. So thank you. Thank you for being you. Well, you're making um, me cry. <laughs> <laughs> try to do that, yes. <laughs> But you deserve every word of this. And I know like everyone's going to join me in saying that as well. Um, she also Better, writes, she'll bite you. <laughs> yes, she may. Um, this is why I'm really glad that this is a Zoom event. And I have this distance. I'm so sorry for you, Alana. But but hey, you know what? You, you probably knew what you agreed to. <laughs> so Martha is the acclaimed author of two books for adults and 10 books for young readers, including Unprecedented, The Game of Love and Death, and Love Santa, including so many more. I know you all have your favorites or things that really meant a lot to you. So again, use that chat and tell us, just share your Martha love with us today. Um, Martha teaches in the master's program at Vermont College of Fine Arts and lives in Seattle with her husband, their two daughters and their wonderful old dog. What's your old dog? Don't you have two dogs now? Yes, she does. So there's, there's Dorothy and yes. Lily. Um, and so Dorothy's our old lady now, and Millie is the young whippersnapper. Okay, wonderful. And you can see all of that on her Instagram feed and her website. We'll put the, all of that through the chat periodically, but I know we must all be following her too. So she'll be joined today by Alana K. Arnold, who I've just met and already adore. So I hope that Alana is going to stop by and visit our store more often and you just have an open invitation at our store, Alana. So Thanks. I hope to see you there whenever you're in Seattle. So Alana writes books for both children and adults. She received her master's in creative writing from the University of California, where she taught creative writing and children's literature. Her books include Girls Are Made Of, which is a finalist for the National Book Award, and A Boy Called Bat, which was selected for the Global Read Aloud. 
so much to clap for. And her book, Dam Damsel, which earned a Prince Honor Award. And yes, there you go. We've got a um, little show and tell. So both of them did come by and sign books for us yesterday. So any books ordered through University Bookstore, and we'll add those links to the chat, will be signed. And um, I just spoke to Martha because I wanted to confirm before, <laughs> before telling you all. But if you also want a personalized copy of that book, when you place your orders, just write that in the comments field as you check out, and we will have her come back all the time and <laughs> sign books for all of you fans. So um, thank you all for supporting a local independent bookstore, for supporting our authors, just supporting books in general, because that brings us all together during this time. Some general notes before I hand the stage off. We want to provide a safe, welcoming, and inclusive environment for all our guests and panelists. So any harmful interactions and comments will result in removal from the event and perhaps attacks by werewolves. Um, yes, the authors agree. So that being said, since we can't gather in person, we do encourage lots of questions and encouraging comments and observations. So use that chat field as often as possible. Show our authors, show yourself some love and just enjoy this event. If you do want to ask the authors questions that they can um, read out at the end of the event, be sure to use the Q&A field, which is separate from your chat field, which is also in the bottom of your screen. So on that note, please join me in welcoming Martha and Alana to our virtual stage. Hello, thank you so much, Grace. What a lovely introduction. It was so lovely. Excited to be here in Seattle. I'm so excited to have, I haven't seen Alana since the pandemic and Alana and I were in the habit of seeing each other quite regularly. Yes. And so um, it's been a wonderful weekend and this is pretty much gonna be the highlight, possibly the highlight of my year. I hope not. Of my life. <laughs> Um, well, you know, how often do you get to sit around with your very dear friend while wearing synthetic fur? Turns out more um, often than one might have thought. <laughs> more often than one might have thought. Anyway, thank you everyone for coming. I'm, I'm seeing the names of all the attendees and I'm really grateful because this is Halloween and everybody has other stuff to do. And we've all had our faces in Zoom far too often um, during this time. And so I'm super grateful um, that you're here and I'm excited to talk about um, this book with Alana and other stuff and I've got um, a little bit of celebrity action coming up and so here we go. All right well here's the book. This is the book that we're here to celebrate today. The beautiful Into the Blood Red Woods uh, by our own dear Martha Brokenbro. Uh, I have had the great pleasure and privilege of watching you create this book over a series of years. And I want to talk about that more later, but before we get into all that, I was hoping maybe you would just tell us. Okay, wait, I want to say that her pleasure and privilege <laughs> equals getting emails from me with, here's what I wrote today. What do you think? Like over and over again. So that's what she finds fun, which is weird, but go figure. There you go. It is, it is. It's, I think I've probably read half a dozen completely different versions of this book. So I feel, and I thought they were all quite wonderful. So there you go. Uh, but will you tell us about the current incarnation of Into the Blood Red Woods and what the readers should I, look out for when I, they're reading it? I will tell, so the, the um, sentence that I used to focus myself as I wrote this book over and over, um, over a period of 11 years, um, was everything you know about fairy tales is a lie. And so what I wanted to do with this book is to, um, obviously tell a story that was entertaining. And on the story level, this is about Ursula and Albrecht. They are um, twins who um, are born to the king and queen. And um, traditionally the throne would go to the firstborn if there were twins, but also traditionally it goes to the male. So um, there's a question, who gets to rule? Is it gonna be a kingdom or a queendom? And so it is about that struggle um, between Ursula and Albrecht. And there's a number of other characters who are um, in there as well. We'll talk about them more later. Um, but this is a book that is also about the power of stories to deceive um, and stories being used as an instrument of power and how many of the narrative patterns that we've internalized from familiar fairy tales are in fact grossly abusive. Um, and so I wanted to kind of take all of that on in a book for young readers. 
That's that sounds about right. Yeah, that was a good job. <laughs> it's a difficult book to put a pin in because it is about so many things. But I think saying that this is a book about power um, and the power of stories um, and the power of the storyteller um, to sort of change the narrative for good or evil makes it not only an important book, but also a timely one. Um, as so many of us have been witnessing the way stories, you know, get told differently by, um, you know, different tellers, um, and the idea of, you know, truth being, um, which was felt so, you know, to me, like such an obviously in one, one sort of way to read that word has become over the last many years, um, challenged. It's definitely been challenged. I mean, we are now living in a world of alternative, alternative facts. facts. Um, and for sure, um, my what I what I learned while writing Unprecedented, which is the biography of Donald Trump, definitely informed my worldview about um, the nature of what is said and what is believed, and also the nature of evil. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely changed. Yeah. Um, and I would like to say that I think this book um, is a, a, a sister book to Alana's Red Hood, um, also to Anne Ursu's um, Troubled Girls of Dragomere Academy, Kelly Barnhill's The Girl Who Drank the Moon. These are um, books about stories and who has the power and subverting traditional narratives. And so it's it feels really good to me just to assert myself into that company of the very best writers there are. Hi. Um, yeah. So, well, uh, well, I know you have a little short reading of this book to I, share with us I and I would do. love to give that I to the audience. Do. I am going to start screen sharing. I'm really bad at this. And so this is just going to take me a little minute. Um, so the audio book um, of Into the Blood Red Woods has two readers. Um, a, a man and a woman, and one of the readers. Um, okay, so if you're friends of John or fan of John Mulaney, you might be aware of his bit about the New York Post. Um, he, the New York Post, said about this guy. This is my audiobook reader, Tam Mutu. Um, they said he looks good in Dr. Zhivago's hat. He was um, he played Dr. Zhivago on Broadway. Now he is the Duke in Moulin Rouge. Um, he is one of the audiobook readers, and I have, um, this is Tam Mutu reading the introduction of Into the Blood Red Woods. One fine day, an eyeless man with a mutilated face arrives in a village by a pale gray sea. The white-skinned man unrolls a blanket. He arranges himself on it. He sets a small metal monkey beside him. He winds something in its back, a black iron key topped with a glass eyeball. The monkey extends an uncanny metal hand. The man sets a coin on the monkey's palm. Its fingers snap closed. Its hand moves to its mouth. The coin drops in. It's a show, a nudge, a hint to passers by. Clink, clink. Feed the monkey a coin and see what happens. People always do. And the eyeless man offers them a tail in return. His face might be startling, but his voice is beautiful. People stop when he speaks. They listen, gasp. They feel as if the skin of the world has been peeled away and they are seeing the truth that lies beneath for the very first time. He knows this. He uses it. Once upon a time, there was a queen who gazed into her enchanted mirror and asked if she was the most beautiful in all the land. Every day, the mirror set her heart at ease, until one day, the mirror's answer changed, filling the queen with envy and rage. This is because women cannot help but be creatures of vanity. And this vanity is dangerous, for it leads women in power to destroy that which they are bound to protect, their queendoms, their thrones, their own daughters. Mesmerize the people pass along the tale, 
from lips to ears to paper to eyes, across acres of land and oceans of time, again and again until eventually the man's tale becomes truth. I know otherwise. I know what really happened. I was there. All right, we're that, back. <laughs> we're back. <laughs> that was Tam Mutu, um, who anyway, if you're in New York, you should probably go see him um, as the Duke in Moulin Rouge. So what fascinates me about this book, especially having seen so many drafts of it, is how many different fairy tales you incorporate into a story that also still feels like one narrative arc. And so I was wondering how you did that. If you could talk some about how do you decide which fairy tales to include and how do you make, take such a big body of stories? What was your, why did you do it? And, and what was your sort of hope by doing it? And what were the challenges? It's a big question. It's a bit, that was actually several questions. It was, but they all go together. They do yeah. all go together. Yeah. Um, so this book started out many years ago. Um, there's a, a famous editor, Patty Lee Gouch, and she gave, I was at a writing workshop and she gave us a writer's prompt that I consider one of the best single prompts um, that you can ever give writers. And what she told us is write a scene where your character is told to do the thing they least want to do, the thing they would never do. And they're told to do it by someone who has absolute power over them. And so I imagined a girl living alone in a castle with a pet rat. The rat is her only companion. And she is told that she needs to kill every rat in the castle. And so from that, burst a whole potential novel. And I started thinking about fairy tales because really for me, anytime there's a castle, there's the potential, you know, fairy tale. Um, and so I started thinking about that and thinking about the story and the Pied Piper, of course. And as I contemplated the narrative of the Pied Piper and breaking it down, so the Hamlin is overrun and not Hamlin where there's a, an MFA program. They don't have a rat problem, um, but a little, maybe they do. Maybe that's it's not why a problem. It's, you should just go to be, <laughs> okay. Um, so anywho, um, the, the, they hire a musician, an artist to rid the village of rats. The Piper does, and then they don't pay the Piper. And so traditionally in retellings, the Piper is the villain. And this struck me as a gross miscarriage of justice, because if you're a person who um, does a job, cannot take that work back um, and you don't get paid for it, that's stealing. Um, and you know it happens to writers and creative people all the time. Um, and so I felt this acutely and um, anyway, so I started thinking, wow, what if I subverted that story and the Pied Piper is a hero rescuing children? And then I started to think about other fairy tales and so many fairy tales. I mean, you heard a little bit um, of Snow White there where it's told as a woman being jealous of the beauty of her stepdaughter and, you know, was willing to do gruesome things. You know, in the original version, she sent a, a man to take her into the woods and remove her, her Leben und Lung, liver and lungs, um, which I think Disney made into heart because hearts are prettier. Um, and anyway, um, so I was like, you know, who tells that story of a woman being so horrible? Um, and Hansel and Gretel, you know, it's the stepmother who kills them. And so I decided that what if all these fairy tales were taking place at the same time, and I could take a whole bunch of them and subvert the narratives so that the original villains and the bad people um, were actually the heroes. And so that was, um, that became a really large challenge. And that's why I think it took me so long to do it. Um, and um, and yet, for me, that's the fun part. I mean, yes and no, because sometimes it's really terrible um, to be in the midst of an idea that you're not sure that you can ever land. Um, but it also became, you know, it's a delight to have a grand ambition for something because that's what helps you learn and grow. So, but when you take so many, one thing I really like about working with fairy tales is that 
you have the basic sort of tent poles of plot, right, are figured out for you. Um, with Red Hood, that was, it felt like a huge, like, check off my list that I wouldn't have to worry about plot, and plot's always the thing that comes the hardest for me. So I really liked that idea that plot would be taken care of. It turned out, even with just one fairy tale, it wasn't that clear uh, about, and I rewrote the third, I guess you call it third act of that book many times, getting, making it work. But I just had the one fairy tale to manipulate into my story. So what about the challenges of taking so many fairy tales? What were some of the fears you had or challenges that you had to overcome? Well, one of the things that I immediately let go with my idea is I was not sticking to that same reading you know some of the some of the same things happen but when you look at them through a different lens for example goldilocks and the three bears i think that there's enormous sympathy for goldilocks um, because oh she's she gets chased off by these bears and how scary she grossly invaded their privacy she ate their food she wrecked their stuff that's breaking and entering it's very very rude and uh, so anyway <laughs> um you can let go of a lot of the specific details if you just have things um, that call to mind the story. Um, the hard part, whenever, because this is a book told from multiple points of view. And one of the things I believe about books, when you tell them from multiple points of view, each viewpoint character has to have a narrative arc. And that's in fact, the hard thing yeah. is having, uh, having those arcs um, come to, and end at the same time. And I also did that with the game of love and death. And that is, um, that's just something you just have to keep on throwing words against the wall until you figure out a shape that works. Um, and I don't know, I mean, I, it works. I read it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> What's interesting to me though, is I thought it worked in other shapes too. And you're hearing you talk about what the book is about I totally agree that the book is about Albrecht and Ursula, uh, but I remember an earlier draft, this book was very much about the Pied Piper, and it still is about them too, but when what you lead with now is this other set of characters, and I just think that's so brave as a writer to let go of something that's pretty darn good and look at a story again from a completely different angle, so I don't know, that's, that's, that's rough, that's a hard thing to do. Um, Oh my gosh. I know it was rough for you too. I mean, I heard you. <laughs> it's not like you just seemed, you know, just effortlessly, you know. No, it was, yeah. no, it was, it was effortful. Yeah. And, you know, I, I know that there are a bunch of writers here and I will say that as a writer, it's a really difficult thing to be not up to the task and to fail. Um, and yet this is one of the good parts about writing is that we can keep trying yeah. until we get it closer, until we get it better. And sometimes, like, I don't want to give any spoilers, um, but the way this story resolves is not typical. Um, and sometimes it doesn't feel very good to have an atypical shape to your resolution because we've all internalized certain narrative shapes. And when our expectations aren't met, it can make for a read that's like, what happened? Um, and so, but it was on purpose um and i mean i can i can tell you one of the things that you might look out for as you read the book is who initiates violent acts and what is the result of violence um, because this is very much a book that questions um our notion of violence as a solution to problems and so anyway yeah so another thing i i remember once oh i'd like to actually talk a little bit about revision so okay because like, is it revision season for us? Does everyone know about Alana's wonderful revision season? I'm fascinated by revision. And I think it's one of those things like it's, it's, I remember, I mean, I went to a graduate school program in the nineties and I don't remember ever learning how to revise. And I think that's because each book requires to a certain degree, its own, you, you, you don't know how to revise a book until you've revisit, you know, revise that book. Uh, and so one thing we, you and I were talking about earlier today is how difficult revision feels, but that how sometimes it's the idea of of the work ahead that is that stops us as opposed to the skill set. Uh, so how do you 
make that leap from, because we know we do have a lot of writers here, from I know this needs a revision, but I can't bring myself to do it, to I'm going to change this book in major ways. I think um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of layers to it. So a good thing to do is to let go of the idea that there's one way to write a book, yeah. that writing a book is linear, yeah. um, and that um, the best books are written in a burst of inexplicable inspiration. Yeah. Um, you are not a failure if you have to um, come and try again. And Alana is right. I discarded entire versions of this novel, just put them in the bin. You don't always have to do that. Um, I have other books where it's that is not mm -hmm. how the process worked. Um, but sometimes with ideas that require a little more finessing, you're going to have to let go of more. And I think um, a willingness to let go of stuff that's not working is a great tool to have. It doesn't mean that you're giving up. It means that you're saying, I've learned this and now I'm gonna try, you know, with this new knowledge, I wanna try something different. Um, and what Alana was alluding to is sometimes, you know, you know that okay, this needs to be done, but oh, such hard work to get there. This is actually a part of the process that um, I enjoy is once I know what needs to happen and I've established my characters in this framework, you know, kind of filling in a hole can be delightful. Yeah. And I think um, to get to that point, it's really um, being willing to say, yes, I did this work and it got me so far and now I let it go. Um, it would be like being disappointed in the 100,000 steps we had to take to the top of a mountain, being disappointed in 99,999 of them because they didn't get us there. And all of those steps yeah. were necessary um, and important. Um, and as with mountain climbing, sometimes you have to meander. You can't go straight up the hill. And um, so don't be afraid of that and, and um, embrace that. And it's not about um, so much embracing the misery and the slog as much as embracing this is the goal of the book and I will do what it takes to get there. And that's kind of a different thing. Embrace the book and not the idea of suffering because that sucks. Yeah. Yeah. I agree completely. So once I remember you said to me, we're talking about what makes a scene and you said to me, every scene is about power, which I thought was really smart. Uh, and I thought a lot about that. And, and part of me was like, no, I can't be true. You know? uh, <laughs> but I've thought a lot about it. And it seems to me that it's very smart. And so this is a book that is full of stories about power and scenes about power shifting, but it's also a book um, about power dynamics. So I'm curious, and you've written other books about powerful people. You wrote The Incredible Unprecedented. Um, and I'm very curious about why you feel so drawn to look at power and power dynamics, the way power functions between different, because this is a book with a lot of characters. So what is it about power and it's so interesting? And important to you in your work, both fiction and nonfiction? You know, okay. So I do think it's an important element of craft. And this is one thing, um, whoever is telling the story has some power. And so if you tell a story that upholds the power of the larger world itself without examining some of those constructs, that possibly you're creating propaganda um, for a corrupt um, patriarchy, cough, cough. Um, and so I think it's really worth examining these things. This is just also absolutely who I am and who I have always been. I am the second child. My beloved older brother is only a year older than I am. And so there was, there was rivalry um, and who gets to, and, and, you know, who gets to decide what we're watching on TV and that sort of thing. But it's also, um, it's very much what I care about. We are living in a world where there are vast um, inequalities in wealth, in access to all sorts of um, public goods and resources. And if we're not thinking about power and power disparities, um, then it might be something that we ask ourselves to do. I don't think every book has to be about mm -hmm. this. This one was overtly about this, but as I think about my own themes as a writer, um, definitely 
um, telling the truth to young people is, you know, I want to tell the truth of the world, whether it's love Santa or unprecedented or, you know, part of Into the Blood Red Woods um, tells what I believe the truth that evil people exist. One of the characters is a psychopath um, and he does not have a tragic backstory or any reason that he's a psychopath. He's just a psychopath. Um, and I think that if we pretend that evil people can always be redeemed and it can always be made better, that that does not prepare young people well to read the world as if it's a book. On that note, I have a, a little <laughs> different curveball question for you what? here, Martha. Okay. Uh, so we're we're dressed as as wear bears uh, or wear creatures because we're wear authors. We're authors. That's right. This wonderful book has two wear bears in it. Uh, there's also a werewolf, but I'm and and actually there's a whole series of wear people uh, who transform into different all different sorts of animals. Uh, and I'm so I thought that to be kind of a revolutionary and fantastic idea. This this you know widening of the of the wear spectrum to include the bears especially. So where did this idea of the wear bears come from? It's so funny because as Alana says, originally this book was about Capella, who's the piper, the musician. And, you know, in one of the versions, I just started writing a chapter about some parents who give birth to a baby who at one point in her infancy just becomes a bear. And I thought, wow, that would be so cool. Um, and this is also a way of examining power because very often parents have children and their children surprise them or don't meet their expectations. Um, and you can imagine many ways that children don't meet the expectations of their parents. And how do parents address that is the difference between good and harmful parenting. Um, and so anyway, I'll, I'll, none of that made it into the book um, in quite the same way. And Ursula really, she ascended to the throne um, in my mind, um, but I just loved her so much and that she was a wear bear. Um, I thought how cool to make um, a, a woman who is large and unapologetically taking up space in the world and also turning into an absolute apex predator. It was a really fun idea. Um, and I love that her brother is horribly jealous. And there's many, you can use this as a metaphor for a lot of different things. And that was another thing that I was um, playing with is the differences between the natural world and the built world and stuff that is single aspect human versus, um, you know, human with, um, close contact with animal natures. And, you know, this is one of the things when I was a kid growing up, humans were special and all the other animals were lower, right? And you weren't supposed to anthropomorphize and um, we weren't supposed to think of, um, you know, animals as having culture or language. All of that stuff is totally nonsense. It's totally untrue. Animals feel there's tons of examples of animal culture and animal language. And it's the separation of humans from animals that I believe has been devastating for us as a species and also for us as a planet. And so one of the things that I wanted to do is to um, center um, a form of humanity that's also very close to wildness. Um, Cause I think that that's interesting and it's important. Yeah, I love the werebears. I think they're fantastic. Me too. Ursula and Sabine mm -hmm. um, are the werebears. And then Hans um, from Hansel and Gretel is a werewolf. Um, and, you know, part of his arc is, you know, is he bad because he's a wolf? And when he kills, what does that mean about him? And, um, and it's just all, you know, because in the stories with wolves, it's always about girls who go off the path, who go into the wild, bad things happen. And, you know, a wolf is just being a wolf. And why is that bad? Um, so anyway, there's so much. Yeah. So much. And I really like how you have characters who intersect both a more than one fairy tale. Like uh, you have the wolf who's both from the, the, the Hans from Hansel and Gretel and uh, a werewolf as you know a wolf character in the woods as well so that's that's pretty clever i thought um 
so another question um, that I have for you is um, why do you, as someone who has like a journalist, you, I don't know if you know about this, Martha, about Martha, but Martha has a degree in journalism um, from some college. I don't remember where. And she uh, was a journalist uh, for a career and also is a nonfiction writer, both of, you know, as we know, a president, but also nonfiction uh, picture books. Um, so I'm wondering, why do you write fantasy if you're someone who's so uh, focused on truth and facts? Okay, so I have to correct one small fact. I don't have a degree in journalism. Oh, I'm sorry. I was my college newspaper editor. That's my, right. My degrees, it, it, classics and English. Classics and English. Classics yeah. and English. Right. And so um, I think fantasy, I love reading it and always have. Um, I also think that when you are considering metaphors, um, that fantasy gives you so many gifts to play with. And um, I love writing that's rich in metaphor. And mm. so it's really, it's satisfying. What about you though? I mean, you you do fantasy and you do. Yeah, I, I'm an accidental fantasy writer. Uh, I never thought of myself as a fantasy writer, but then I had an idea for a book that was set in a castle with a damsel and a, and a dragon. And I guess I'm a fantasy writer now, which I'm kind of thrilled by that I sort of became one, um, not out of like, you know, conscious choice, but just that was the material I was working with. So but it was interesting, it's interesting to have written a fantasy novel after writing mostly contemporary realistic novels, because you realize as an author that when you trade, you change sort of categories or genres like that, you're a new writer again. And the audience probably could very well likely have no idea uh, what your other books are. It was a very funny experience. <laughs> I wanted a book tour for, for Damsel. And lots of people were uh, asking me, is this, is this your first book? And I was like, no, I think it was my seventh book. But it was pretty funny. And I was like, oh, it's a whole, because some fantasy readers, they are fantasy readers and they it's, are it's, very, you know, focused you, on you know what, what it, they love. It is true. Oh, my fur is so itchy it's I think I have fleas um okay so she did do research for this fantasy she researched she was telling me while as she was writing a bit about the groom of the stool which didn't make it into the book and so I feel like bringing do you want to tell the us groom the groom of the stool remember no, there was oh she's forgot that. I forget everything okay. I wish I remember okay so in certain castles they would have someone paw through the poop that's of right the prince to examine what's in there. To see if he's doing well, if he's healthy. I had forgotten about that. That didn't make it into the book. People were very upset that I, I that I have a euphemism for the prince's penis. I called it the yard. And people thought that was so disgusting. It was actually a real euphemism for, you know, I, the king's I penis know. back I in the day. And I, I, it's interesting the to me. The yard. I know. You about. give someone a foot and they'll take, <laughs> they'll the, take yard the yard. And, yeah. and, um, I love it because like, you know, a foot is obviously smaller than a yard. So I just like, you know, I thought that was aggrandizement was, of, was pretty Of course, pretty can you imagine you could pee around corners? Yeah, I thought that was um, pretty great. But okay, so that was her seventh book. It has seven sections, each with seven chapters. I think it was my seventh book. I, I may have just made keep that number. The, keep that. Well, as <laughs> as we know, she sometimes forgets. And, Terrible memory. And, and I don't. But anyway, so, but that is, isn't that lovely? Yes, it is. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate that very much. I'll take it. Yeah. Uh, I very much like thinking about structure in books. And sometimes I find that when I'm in that book, I had the structure early on, but sometimes I find out that a great way to revise a book, and I saw you do this with your book too, is to make a different decision about what the structure of the book could be, uh, as opposed to necessarily, you know, like the plot elements might stay very similar. But changing structure can also be a great a great way in a great opening door for a revision. It definitely can be. So how I think about it as a writer. So you got your character. That's who the book is about. Mm -hmm. The plot is what happens and how the character responds and is changed. The structure is how you reveal that to the reader. So sometimes, you know, we'll reveal it with multiple points of mm -hmm. view. Sometimes, um, like in um, Kate Messner has a book that's told, um, in, you know, with emails and with other little artifacts. Um, and I know that Anne or Sue is going to jump in and tell you what the name of that book is because I'm forgetting it. Um, sometimes books are told in nonlinear fashion. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to say, but I will say that a very brilliant writer has a novel that's coming out and it's told in reverse order. Um, and it really all depends on what effect you're trying to create with the reader. And so I wanted with my structure, um, originally, 
I, if you've read um, Kate Atkinson's Life After Life, this is a book that starts over many times until the character knows what she needs to know in order to um, end her narrative. And so one of the ideas I had was, okay, there's no such thing as once upon a time. And so these stories keep starting over and get more complex and add more characters in. It just, I couldn't make it work. Mm -hmm. But when I did think of a structure where there's a, a storyteller at the beginning and the end and interstitial elements where we hear the traditional versions of fairy tales as told by um, a corrupt storyteller who we don't know who, this person's identity, um, that that would be a way of using um, the structure to underscore kind of the aboutness of the book. Yeah. That it's yes, I think yeah. structure. That's a great way to think about it. Is I think a lot about structure is revealing the aboutness of a book or what the thematic heart of a book is. And if you can, if you can figure out if you're using the right structure to reveal something that isn't necessarily said on the page, structure can can add an extra layer of meaning yeah. without having to call attention to itself. I think so. And and I I just like it. Like yeah, I, love, I like it too. I love books <laughs> as objects. I mean, they're neat. Yeah. And and you know, to be able to kind of play with the form yeah. a little bit and and do stuff. I mean, it's really fun for me. Yeah. And so I hope that yeah. that people enjoy it as much as I do. Yeah. And I also think structure, I'm a very synesthetic writer, so I feel like I can feel the shape of my story. And so finding the right structure for a story when I'm working on a revision helps me to what she's, hold the whole thing in my head. What she's saying is she's the groom of the stool. Of her, <laughs> you have to sift through her and writing. find the good stuff is the basic yeah. gist. So we have some questions in the Q&A that I definitely want to get to. So I think we can switch okay. over uh, to uh, the questions. So here we go. We have a question from, oh my gosh, we have a lot of questions from Henry Neff. Henry, oh, that's this so is fantastic. Good. Wow, you've done a good job, Henry. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. And we have another uh, questions too. And feel free to continue to add questions. Hi, uh, so I should, yeah, these are Henry Neff's questions. Um, um, for those of you who have not encountered Henry's Imperium series, um, it, it's a wonderful fantasy, and he also did the illustrations. He's very hateable, this Henry Neff, because his talent is so immense. Um, the question, <laughs> not really hateable, quite beloved. Um, who's a character in this book, main or otherwise, that you're excited for readers? Let's each pick one. Okay. Okay, and then on the count of three, uh, we can say our character that we're excited for readers to meet. Okay. One. Oh, wait, wait. I'm gonna maybe I'm gonna think a little more. Um, okay. One, two, three. Greta. I was gonna say Hans. Oh, oh yes. Yes. sibling. So Greta and Hans. Um, and so Hans is. Um, should I say? No. Okay. We're excited for you. We're to excited meet for you Hans to meet Hans and, Hans and yes. Greta. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, siblings. Uh, all right. So, why do you think fairy tales have, have persisted as a storytelling form? What do they tell us about us, Henry? You basically asked i'm so glad you did because i had some questions here and i didn't want to just ask mine so i'm yeah. very grateful to you for asking that so why fairy tales why so i was mm -hmm. i was um listening to an author eb Zaboy, um american street pride um my life as an ice cream sandwich um and she was talking about the difference between fairy tales and mythology um, and it resonated with me. My book, The Game of Love and Death, is about the meaning of love and death. And there are two characters in it, love and death themselves, and they're like Greek gods. So that's mythology. And she said that mythological books deal with cosmic questions and fairy mm. tales are how we treat each other. Well, and smart. so um, I, I yeah. thought it was, and, and, and it was while I was working on this book and it really helped crystallize the focus for me because this is a book about power and how it is shared among humans and how um, harm, how harm comes to people who are marginalized. Um, and so I think fairy tales have persisted for a lot of reasons. Um, um, Malcolm Gladwell in Revisionist History has um, a three-part podcast about the Little Mermaid. And um, there's a writer, I believe his name is Angus Fletcher, who has written a book. And he talks about this. Um, and there's two kinds of things. Um, fairy tales used to be about people bumbling along and um, you know how, how um, good things can happen to bad people. 
they changed and the nature and, and um, we started to expect fairy tales to have a moral component to them. So like Cinderella sweeping away at the ashes, you know, eventually she gets discovered by a prince with a foot fetish and lives happily ever after. And so I think um, we like as a culture in storytelling just desserts. Um, I want you to listen to this podcast, though, because it's going to make you question that, especially when you're writing for young readers. I heard recently uh, we had Dashka Slater come and speak at Hamlin this last summer, and she's the author of the 57 Bus and also the adorable Escargot, which is a beautiful picture book about a cute little uh, escargot. And she was talking about the differences between the Grimm and the Hans Christian Andersen fairy tales and who is rewarded and who is punished in each sort of set. Uh, and I, I thought that she was just uh, fantastically brilliant in talking about retribution power. And I, th I think fairy tales continue to persist because they continue to give us um, a framework for thinking about, about things that matter, like, like power. Um, and they do get retold generationally, depending on, I think, the thinking of, of, of who should have power. Um, and I think, I think it's interesting as we, as a uh, culture in the United States have felt that children are more and more whole people and less and less sort of their uh, their parents property. Um, some of the retellings that I have seen, uh, you know, give more give more power uh, to characters who did in the traditional storytelling uh, were objects, which is something that speaks to me as a human very particularly with along with my sort of belief system about about children. Me too. And I think this yeah. is why we're such good friends. Yes. Um, I also, so uh, I read fairy tales when I was a kid for wish fulfillment, you know, because amazing things happen. And as a grown up, now I'm rethinking, well, why did I wish mm -hmm. for that? And what does that mean? And what does it say? I mean, you know, to wish to be the one, you know, who's beautiful. Yeah. Like, why do we want girls to wish for that? We should not. Um, it's harmful, but anyway. Yeah, I think that's super interesting too. I think paying attention to which fairy tale, if you're a writer and you're thinking you might want to play with fairy tales, paying attention to the stories that were meaningful to you when you were young and then asking those questions about why. Like I was very hung up on stories in which princesses uh, were centered, but queens were, uh, were evil. Uh, and I never wanted to play dress up or pretend as a queen. I always wanted to be the the princess who needed to be rescued. And I think that that really was influenced by my upbringing and my sort of, you know, I had, had a powerful queen figure in my life that terrified me. And so looking back, it makes sense why those were the stories that I was drawn to and why I'm so interested in writing about That's queens funny, now. Because when I was four years old, I asked Santa for a queen suit. I skipped right through the princess phase and I'm like, just give me the queen yeah. already. Yeah. And so I wore my queen suit um, and it was a scratchy gold lame, um, but I, I wore it. And interestingly, it was sewn from the same pattern of my witch suit. Um, oh, that's pretty fantastic. I love that. All right, so let's go down and we'll, we'll ask, look at Anne Ursus questions. Hi there, Anne. Um, Anne has two questions. Did you have any delightful discoveries during revision? And what are you most proud of with this book? Oh. I'm trying to think of delightful discoveries um, that I had during revision. I think um, rediscovering how to get inside a character again, because sometimes when you're paying so much attention to the craft of writing that it starts to um, not be uh, you know, about what it is to be a person. And mm -hmm. so rediscovering that um, has been great. And I am at work on a different project that feels much better as a result. Um, what I'm most proud of with this book, I think, um, is its unabashed point of view as a piece of art. So some books are meant to, um, you know, wrap us in comfort. And I love those books and I read those books. Um, and it's like some art is meant to look pretty on your wall and make your house feel homey. Um, there's other kinds of art. I, I go back often to Picasso's huge mural size painting um, uh, that he did after the Nazis bombed a small Spanish town. And it's this enormous painting that is full of emotion and point of view and a condemnation of this type of violence. And this book is in that category. It is not a comfort read. It um, is uh, it's a challenging book and 
Um, I am very pleased to deliver that sort of experience to young people, um, you know, just as a, 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 a howl at the moon um, that I hope is noticed. Um, all right, well, Helen Landoff asks, do you ever think about structure before writing a first draft or do you usually address it during revision? Um, there's so much that I'm thinking about in a first draft and sometimes I'll play with structure, um, but it typically is something that, you know, comes in a revision or it's an idea that I'll get two thirds of the way through the book and then have to, like my very first novel, Divine Intervention has interstitials from the Guardian Angel Handbook and that helps, um, shape and direct the narrative and, and that wasn't something that I came up with until midway through yeah How about you usually structure is something I I I, think I when I go to revi revise I look at what I've made um and I at that I start to, what what did I choose as a structure and does the structure that I've chosen satisfy me and does it serve the story and if not how can I change it the exception of that for me would be damsel which I was probably on like day three of drafting that book when I decided, oh, this is going to be a book that's written in seven sections of seven chapters a section. And each, each it wasn't even day three. It might have been day one. Even. It yeah, was we really, were together. We were together. We were, well, the, Aunt I Mary still, Lynn's apartment we in were, San Francisco. Yeah, we were mm -hmm. in San Francisco. We were on the rooftop mm -hmm. of an apartment. And Alana mentioned that an editor was seeking a fairy tale. And I told her a story from On the Road. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, Alana's eyes they got so big. And I said, my, what big eyes you have. <laughs> um, and then we went downstairs and started writing. I was at work on my Hamilton biography mm -hmm. and she was at work. And so we would write and then read to each other. And it was really quick that she's like, this is going to be like this. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and it was quite wonderful to, to figure out the structure because it gave me a skeleton, um, which which felt in that case, in that book. She I would case, say it was. It gave you big teeth. Yes. Well, well maybe big not. Teeth yeah, she yes, had. Yes, yeah. Yes. yeah. She threw. Uh, so that was the, uh, so structure. You can come at it at different points depending on the project. Well, and as if you're willing to be flexible about your yeah. work and to revise it and to say, oh, this book could be this. Yeah. Um, then you can kind of take apart these things and put them back together and and structure them. And and I do really like. Um, Scrivener software uh, because it makes it easy to move pieces yeah. around a lot easier than in Microsoft Word. Yeah, and I'm afraid of Scrivener, so I barely ever use it. But I move things around in Microsoft Word. But I saved the last draft, and then I I print it out sometimes and move things around. Um, I did use Scrivener when I rearranged the structure of what girls are made of, and I found it to be. But you were close, and you walked me through Scrivener. But I I've forgotten how to use it because I have a terrible memory. Um, all right, so Kim, hi, Kim Tomsic, another writer uh, joining us today. Is there a fairy tale you cut from your retelling, but you can't stop thinking about it? Um, there's a lot of stuff that I cut and I can't totally remember everything that's cut versus made it inside. Um, but there was more Rumpelstiltskin um, that I keep thinking about. Yeah. Um, but the one, like if I wanna choose one fairy tale um, that, makes me just burn it's the red shoes and you'll see it in there um and um anyway and i know there have been a number of red shoes retellings anna marie mm -hmm. macklemore's um, their book is fantastic deepest darkest red i think is what dark, and dark, dark, red. dark and deepest yeah red. It's a beautiful anyway book. beautiful book um and a, another um very interesting um retelling of it and you know, just think about the injustice of a girl putting on a pair of red shoes and dancing to death and the shoes were considered her vanity. And, and isn't that cruel? Cause like, right. That's a story in which, yeah, the, uh, the character is punished for a sort of a normal desire, which is sort of a category that, um, Joshka Slater was talking about too. It, it does. It feels like, a, you know, it's a terrible, terrible injustice. It's a terrible injustice because who cares if someone wants a pair of red mm -hmm. shoes, um, like it's not, it doesn't hurt anybody at all if you're wearing red shoes and yet she suffered a terrible fate, um, mm -hmm. for it. And this is, you know, this is a way of saying, you know, girls, you must be beautiful, but you must also not be vain. And so setting up an impossible, um, expectation, mm -hmm. um, let's see, we have, oh, I which here we go. Well, I missed, skipped one. Uh, oh. Sunday Fraser asked, which fairy tale that you used in your book do you feel speaks most relevantly to what we're living through today? Um, oh, you know, I really 
feel strongly about all of them. Um, you'll recognize the emperor's new clothes. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, there's uh, when a leader is obviously foolish and obviously wrong and people are going along with it yeah. anyway. Um, and what it takes to speak truth to not just that one powerful voice, but all the voices that are holding up that lie. Yep. Yeah. Um, and so yeah. there's that you'll you'll see a version of that. Yeah, that's a that's a good answer. Liz Garten Scan Scanlon. Liz. Hi, brilliant wear authors. Hello. I'm so interested in the wares and what they what they say, uh, what you say about them, about power through them, about power, but also and I love this question, especially for young readers about transformation and how it can be scary and shameful to transform. How much did you think about their theme and, and messaging as opposed to just about their furry growing selves? I will answer for you just briefly and I'll say a lot. There are a lot, a lot, but you can expand. <laughs> um, I definitely thought a lot. And, and um, you know, at first it was like, just really cool to think you have this power within you. But then I started thinking about people who are, are not necessarily any one thing. And so you can look at that as, you know, someone who's, a writer and an athlete, but you can also look at it as someone who has other aspects of their identity that are non-binary. And so that's where I wanted to think very carefully um, and not cause any harm. And just as this is a this is an embrace of people who um, are not just any one thing, but also the metaphor of um, we are human beings are animals and we have an animal nature and animals depend and interact with each other and live in the world, not the built world, um, but the natural world. And so um, I thought really hard about that. And I hope that young readers who read it to talk about, you know, what kind of where are they? Um, you know, what is your animal nature? I think we probably only have time for one more question. And since it's Halloween, I'm going to address the Halloween question that we have here from Stephanie. Since it's Halloween, I want to ask about scares and terrors. What, if anything, scares you the most about the writing process and being an author? Um, there's so much that scares me. Yeah. About I'm scared all the time. All, uh, Not just about being a writer, but being like a human in the world is, is kind of terrifying. It's, it's, I mean, you get, you're afraid of rejection. You're afraid of failure. You're afraid that um, you fail to see your work and anticipate how others might see it. And you, you just, you, um, you mess up. Yeah. Um, and that is scary. Um, I had a dream a couple of nights ago um, that I was on Goodreads, which I should not have gone there even in a dream, but someone um, talked about a book that I'm working on and said, one star, too silly to read. And you know what I did in my dream? I hunted that person down. <laughs> I did. And I got him in an alley and I, and he was like lying down on the ground. And then I realized, oh my gosh, I, you know, this is a really bad thing for yeah. guys. People are allowed to respond to yeah. Um, your book however they want. And that's a scary thing is to let go of your work and, and realize that you've done your best. Your work is not you. Some people are going to love it. Some people are going to hate it. Some people will entirely miss the point. Um, and maybe that's your failure. Maybe it's just their level of preparation. So letting go of um, the idea that you can walk out and and everybody will love your stuff. And that, that sucks because we all want to be loved. Yeah. As someone who grew up really, really, really finding it very important to try to, you know, like wonder, do people like me? Do people like me? How do I help make people like me? It's, it can feel very vulnerable as to be, to be any sort of writer or artist. I think that's actually why it's really important that um, we have friends yeah. to, um, go on this journey with and so you all of you who came are my friends and i'm grateful um for your company and those of you who are writers in this room um you know I, i've read your work and i cheer you on um and i'm so grateful um uh the books will be available um signed and i am happy to inscribe them i also had these very beautiful stainless yes. steel bookmarks made um and so i will include a bookmark um if you would like one but anyway that's it for us um thank you so very much thanks to university bookstore and grace um and 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 uh, mieko so i'm awfully pleased to have done this thank you 
Thank you, both of you. Thank you, Martha. Thank you, Lana. That was incredible. We don't want you to leave, but it's Halloween. You probably have to go show off that costume Anything. somewhere. Full size so, thanks to my house. You are going to do it? You're going to go trick or treating? We're going to eat. We're going to eat candy. And, but we have. Oh, well, yeah, so that's perfect. To my house, everybody, and um, get a full size <laughs> So thank you for sharing more about Into the Blood Red Woods with us and um, happy book birthday in advance. And please, everybody, place those orders, get those bookmarks, they're gorgeous. And thank you to our audience for spending your Halloween afternoon with us. And before we go, this is a little unorthodox, but this was an unorthodox event. Let's see your feet. That I saw it in the comments. People want to see your feet. Let's see your... <laughs> So this is an actual onesie, right? You're, you've got the, the feet are separate. The, the feet, the but feet we put them separate. on anyway, even but, though we didn't have to, even though we didn't. We didn't. Yeah, because <laughs> that's how committed we are. We're, we're I saw committed. it on Instagram and I'm like, oh my gosh, the audience needs to see those feet. <laughs> well, thank you, for thank you again. And um, this is the only I hope we can do this all in person. But I'm really glad that we're able to gather on Zoom because I saw in the comments people were coming from far and wide just to hear you both speak. So I'm glad we're able to bring everyone together. So happy Halloween, everyone. And um, go grab a copy of this book. It sounds amazing. It is amazing. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Bye. Bye. Everyone. Thanks Thank again you. for coming.